my name is Rob Rosbrook, and uh, I'm going to give the second lecture in this um, uh, three lecture series on uh, bone tumors. Um, this lecture is going to be on the limb reconstruction after malignant bone tumor uh, using a live bone reconstruction approach. And uh, following this lecture, Dr. Fragman is going to speak on um, management of bone defects. And I think that uh, these will complement um, Dr. Reef's uh, nice introduction to this field. Uh, some of the patients whose identity is shown in this lecture have given consent for this. So as you've heard uh, from Taylor, there are various reconstructive options after bone tumor resection, and they include uh, metal spacers, joint replacement, um, allograft, which is cadaver bone, and also uh, free fibula using the opposite uh, leg fibula donor. Um, this lecture that I'm gonna present to you is gonna focus on um, an approach using distraction osteogenesis and sort of the concept of a live bone limb reconstruction uh, using the patient's own bone, which is uh, durable. And this approach also takes very much into account the concept of correcting deformity and um, addressing leg length discrepancy at the same time. So I'm going to show you a few examples to illustrate some of the concepts. Um, this is, these are x-rays of uh, Ian, who at the age of 18 developed um, pain in his uh, leg when he was playing basketball, and after biopsy was diagnosed with a Ewing's sarcoma. And this was addressed by a uh, radical excision of the tumor, leaving a 17 centimeter bone defect and temporarily stabilized with this external fixator. The reconstruction of this was then performed using distraction osteogenesis. And what you're seeing here is a bifocal approach, meaning we're lengthening in the proximal tibia, we're closing down the defect in the middle, and we're lengthening in the, in the, prox in the distal tibia. So trifocal approach, three levels of activity, um, the middle is where the defect is closing down, and then we're transporting bone from the top down and from the bottom up. At the end of the um, distraction phase, there is docking, and you can see that's the connection point. And then what you're looking at in those two areas are the regenerates of the proximal and the distal tibia. The proximal tibia tends to heal a little bit more robustly, and so I planned uh, more lengthening in that area and less lengthening in the distal tibia. Uh, this is what it looks like at the end of distraction with the fixator on. In general, the patient is encouraged to be active and to walk, um, to use their adjacent joints. And um, this is the uh, uh, x-ray after uh, nailing was done at the time of the uh, fixator removal. So this was a bone transport and nailing uh, technique uh, to try to um, uh, protect the regenerate and also to um, help the docking site heal. Patient was uh, quite functional and uh, the healing at the docking site required a little bit of uh, extra attention, additional uh, procedure uh, for some grafting and an adjuvant plate uh, was applied and that led to complete bone healing. Uh, this, these are x-rays a few years later after the uh, intramedullary nail was uh, removed and the, uh, the plate was just left in place. Um, and uh, you can see uh, the dramatic uh, reconstruction of the bone that had ensued. I do want to illustrate that although the patient was doing really well, um, he did have a persistent leg length discrepancy of about three quarters of an inch. And, um, and this, so this was addressed in a staged fashion using an internal lengthening nail in the femur. And that led to equalization of the leg lengths. This is uh, Ian when he's all done, um, equal and fully functional. We've published our experience uh, with bone tumor reconstruction using the Ilizarov method or this live bone reconstruction approach. 
And in 20 patients, we had an average bone lengthening of 7.1 centimeters. All of the limbs were salvaged and all patients ended up with good and excellent outcome scores. Here's another example um, of a patient named Maria who at the age of 16 developed uh, pain in her distal leg and ankle and was diagnosed and was treated for a low-grade osteosarcoma that at stage one was resected and filled with a PMMA spacer. So the PMMA spacer, as you can see, uh, is a, um, um, a bone cement that is placed just to maintain the, uh, the defect until the definitive reconstruction can be done. Now, she's lost the distal 10 centimeters of the tibia, and by definition, the ankle joint as well. So at the uh, reconstructive surgery, um, the PMMA spacer was removed, uncovering the 10 centimeter distal tibia defect. And the approach was one of bone transport ankle fusion. And you can see the osteotomy done in the proximal tibia and gradual transport of the segment distally until it docks with the um, talus. Again, the patient is ambulatory during the uh, procedure. Uh, as the limb is well stabilized in the uh, Ilizarov frame. This is a two-level Ilizarov tailor spatial frame uh, illustrating a bifocal approach. At the end of the uh, um, lengthening, and this is into the consolidation phase, you can see uh, consolidation of the uh, tibia regenerate or the lengthening site and docking at the ankle site. After healing and frame removal, there is a solid arthrodesis that is stable and well aligned at the ankle and the proximal tibia regenerate, both on the AP and lateral views, is well healed and well aligned. The patient has an excellent functional result um, with equal leg lengths, a stable limb, absence of deformity, and despite the ankle fusion, is actually functioning at a very high level. Next, uh, I want to show you uh, a case that um, involves prior treatment that had complications. So this is Karina, who at the age of uh, 13 uh, was treated for osteosarcoma with a resection of the um, distal part of her femur. And it was reconstructed at an outside institution with a free fibula. Now, what happened is over time, uh, the free fibula uh, deformed at its junction with the host bone and leg length discrepancy developed both as a result of the uh, deformity and also as a result of the damaged growth plate of the distal femur. So I think this case illustrates that um, uh, tumor reconstruction involves resection of the tumor and reconstruction of the bone defect. But there are also other considerations, including uh, the subsequent growth from the, the growth plate that, is, uh, that may be affected, and also um, the deformities that can, uh, and complications that can occur. So again, to illustrate here, this was the free fibula. Um, and so there was a non-union with deformity at the distal junction plus there was leg length discrepancy. So the approach here was a bifocal approach, two levels, okay? The proximal level involved an eight centimeter lengthening of the uh, femur, and this was over lengthened by two centimeters because we were able to anticipate the amount of remaining growth that was absent in the distal femur. And then there was non-union repair and correction of the deformity at the distal femur junction. Here you can see the fixation in the proximal femur and in the distal femur as the healing is progressing. Uh, she had a two-level frame that it was used to accomplish this reconstruction. Again, patient was mobile and active during the treatment. And in the end, the, um, this was supplemented with a uh, plate and screws 
to protect the non-union repair. And you can see the eight centimeters of new bone regenerate in the proximal femur. At one year, Karina has a really uh, excellent uh, functional outcome with equal leg lengths and the absence of deformity. And I want to show you a final case that also illustrates uh, some additional concepts, uh, including complication management and um, um, additional growth that is missing from the growth plate. So Luke, at the age of 12, had a sarcoma excision from his proximal tibia. This was reconstructed with a combination of allograft and free fibula, and he developed a non-union at the proximal junction and a union at the distal junction. Uh, the growth, the growth um, of the proximal tibia was also compromised, and he had a, um, uh, a flap over the area. So you can see the non-union, you can see the deformity. Um, this illustrates the magnitude of the deformity. And you can see the free fibula, the, uh, excuse me, the flap on the proximal tibia, um, illustrating that a um, surgical approach uh, is also um, complicated from a soft tissue management point of view. Furthermore, you can, we can use calculations to um, do a very good job estimating the amount of growth that will additionally be missing from the proximal tibia growth plate. And this has to do with using the multiplier method and understanding the percentages of growth that come from the proximal versus the distal tibia. And in the end, my calculation was that there was going to be an additional 3.3 centimeters of growth missing from the proximal tibia for Luke. My approach was a minimal incision technique given the uh, a flap to um, um, stimulate uh, the non-union repair of the proximal tibia and to inject bone graft. I used the fixator to correct the deformity and provide compression and stability. And this is what it looks like after the fixator had been on for some time and there was a union achieved. He's doing well, he's walking around, but he is complaining of uh, deformity and pain in his opposite ankle on the left side. So what had occurred on the left side is as a result of the free fibula, he developed a valgus deformity of his distal tibia growth plate. And this is one of the complications that you can see from harvesting a free fibula in a growing child. This was managed with a procedure called guided growth, uh, where the growth was tethered on the medial side and that encouraged additional growth on the lateral side. So here's Luke uh, after he's all healed and his ankle is, um, has been repaired on the opposite side. And as expected, he has uh, three centimeters of, uh, addition, of, of final leg length discrepancy at the age of 15 and a half. And so the approach here was to avoid the tibia and lengthen the femur. And so the approach that I uh, taking a situation like that now is to use an internal lengthening rod. This is a motorized internal nail with a magnet that sits inside the nail. A remote control device is applied to the surface of the skin, which spins the magnet and gradually elongates the nail. And this is what it looks like as the distraction uh, is progressing. The remote control device is pictured here and it is applied to the anterior part of the thigh. And this is what it looks like after healing of a three centimeter lengthening. Now this is a different patient, but just to illustrate um, the internal lengthening nail and how it works, this is a three month progression to eight centimeters of length in the femur. You can see the distraction gap that gradually gets longer and longer. This is typically elongated at one millimeter per day. And at the end of the distraction, there we have achieved the length desired, but the bone is soft 
and the regenerate needs time to consolidate. And that is pictured over here. Over the next couple of months, the regenerate will fill in, mineralize, consolidate, and become completely strong. So in, co in conclusion, uh, what we've gone over is an approach called a live bone limb reconstruction approach. And the advantages of this approach uh, are that once the bone is healed, it does not loosen or disintegrate over time. It's an approach that pays a lot of attention to leg length discrepancy and deformity. It's a, um, it gives us the opportunity to preserve joints and avoid joint replacement. It allows us to preserve the fibula and avoid the need for free fibula transfer. And it, it allows us to avoid uh, allograft. Now, of course, not all of these, appro every approach has its uh, time. And so this is not for all cases, obviously, but this is, um, I've shown you examples of how this approach is used and how it can be effective for long-term limb salvage. Thank you for your attention.